Welcome to the second day of Freight Week STL 2023. I'm Mary Lamey, Executive Vice President of Multimodal Enterprises for Bi-State Development, which includes the St. Louis Regional Freightway as one of its enterprises. Yesterday, we kicked off Freight Week STL with Innovation Day, during which we received an update on the advancements St. Louis-based Intramotive is making in the development of autonomous rail cars, learned about an Israeli company's efforts related to the digitalization of global waterways, and heard about the collaboration between local firm Uncommon and Port of Long Beach to create a supply chain information highway. These organizations have tremendous potential to impact the movement of freight in the years to come. In today's session, we're going to focus on the continuing investments underway at four ports in the St. Louis region and recent infrastructure funding wins. We'll learn how the improvements being made will help support continued growth in traditional barge services and intermodal operations in the ag coast of America, while helping to prepare for the arrival of innovative new container on vessel service in the Midwest. Before we dive into our topic, we'd like to thank our sponsors. This year's presenting sponsors include the Boeing Center, Washington University, Steadfast City, St. Louis, University of Missouri, St. Louis, Millstone, Weber, and Amron. Our supporting sponsors are the Jerry Costello Group and the Hauser Group. Associate sponsors for this year include Southern Illinois Builders Association, Terracon, Alvarisi, Castle Contracting, HNTB, CDI, and Brinkman Constructors. We appreciate all of the sponsorship support that makes it possible for us to deliver Freight Week STL. I'll be moderating today's session, and our panelists include Dennis Wilsmeyer, Executive Director with America Central Port, Susan Taylor, Port Authority Director with St. Louis Development Corporation, Ed Walbacher, Port Director with Kaskaskia Regional Port District, and Jim McNichols, Executive Director with Jefferson County Port Authority. Welcome everyone, and we'll start with asking each of you to introduce yourself and your organization. Be sure to give our audience an idea of where your port facilities are located. Dennis, let's begin with you. Tell us a little bit about you and America Central Port. Thank you very much, Mary. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, America Central Port District is a special purpose unit of local government. We are located in Madison, Granite City, and Venice, Illinois, although our boundaries actually extend all the way up to Grafton, Illinois, along the Mississippi River. We have 1,200 acres of property. Most of those in the St. Louis area would remember us for the former Granite City Army Depot property uh, or the U.S. Army Charles Melvin Price Support Center, which closed in 2002. We inherited a good portion of that property and actually have some acreage uh, north of there as well along the Chain of Rocks Canal. We have 2.1 million square feet of warehouse space today, 70,000 square feet of office space, and also 150 apartment units, uh, which were left over from the Army Depot property that we operate on a daily basis. We have direct service at our Granite City Harbor facility from Norfolk Southern Railroad, and the Madison Harbor facility is served by Terminal Railroad Association, which is owned by all the six Class 1 railroad carriers. We, uh, those two river harbors bring in about 3 to 3.1, 3.2 million tons of product each year by barge. Uh, and we're also located adjacent to Illinois Route 3, which is the connection mm -hmm. from Interstate 70 to the south on, uh, on up to Interstate 270 to the north. We have five entrances off of Illinois Route 3 that gain access to our property. I would say, generally speaking, the port district, as many other ports in, in the region and throughout the country are, we are economic development generators. We are here for the purpose of creating jobs, and we do that through a lot of investment in our property that tries to attract then companies to come to the area. And over the last 20 years or so, we have generated, uh, had companies that come in and, and created about a thousand new jobs across the property. Uh, again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, Susan, now it's your turn to introduce yourself and your port facility. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Taylor. I'm director of the City of St. Louis Port Authority. Our port district comprises about 10,000 acres along our 19 plus miles of riverfront. Uh, we move about uh, 15 to 18 million, to uh, million tons a year across all those facilities. Our district is crisscrossed by about six class one railroads and our local switching line, Terminal Railroad Association, 
four interstates and we have 11 river crossings here. Uh, we're a landlord port, which means we don't move goods ourselves, our tenants do. Um, and so we have about 40 leases with shippers and carriers and fleeting operators up and down our riverfront. Chief among them is our city's uh, municipal river terminal. Uh, it's, uh, it's about a mile and a half north of the arch. It's operated by SCF Lewis and Clark terminals. It's about a 40 acre site with a 2000 foot dock uh, that can take up to 250 ton crane loads. We have rail directly in and out of the yard there. And we have about 250,000 square feet of warehouse space um, all of which it's on both sides of the flood wall. And that warehousing, all, all of it has either nine inch or 14 inch floor slabs. Plus we have 67 fleeting berths there. So that's our main terminal in the city of St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Ed, you're up next to tell us about Kaskaskia Regional Port District and your role with it. Yes, I'm Ed Walbacher. I'm the port director for the Kaskaskia Regional Port District been here 11 years, and our port has been around 55 years, a little over that. Uh, we are unique in that we have five different terminal locations, uh, one on the Mississippi River called Kellogg, and four on the Kaskaskia River. Our port district covers three counties, Monroe, Randolph, and St. Clair, and St. Clair is home to Belleville, Illinois, and it's also the Metro East area. Our northern boundary extent includes the JB Bridge, uh, for people who are familiar with the bridges at St. Louis, and it goes down to Chester, Illinois. Each terminal location that we own has unique characteristics to it. Uh, some are linked with the CN Railroad or the UP, and we can offer a, a wide variety of services to tenants. Um, we're also unique in that state of Illinois, when they created the navigation channel with the um, the Corps of Engineers having the lock and dam at the Kaskaska River, uh, bought 20,000 acres of land on both sides of the river. And so all of that land, uh, the only way for development to occur is through the Port District. So we're the economic developer for the Kaskaska River and our site on the Mississippi. And my job is really not only to support uh, job creation, but to anticipate um, our term operations needs for the future so that we can be ready and able to serve our customers and grow our port. Um, and that takes time uh, to make that happen. But we have been successful in doing that. And so we're poised for significant growth at the Kaskaska Regional Port District. Thank you, Ed. Finally, Jim, give us a little background about the Jefferson County Port Authority and your role as executive director. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I feel kind of like the piker here. I don't. We don't currently operate any facilities. We have a a dock in Kimswick, but uh, so what I figured I would focus my time on is is a little history, like Mary said, of the of the background of the Jefferson County Port Authority. So the Port Authority was established in 1976 as a political subdivision of Jefferson County, which is located south of St. Louis County in St. Louis City, uh, to quote promote city state and national publicity of all port affairs and the development and encouragement of waterborne transportation. In uh, 2013, after a long period of consultation and with the support of the county, uh, the Jefferson County Port Authority applied to the Missouri Highway and Transportation Commission was granted the authority to expand its boundaries, political boundaries, to the contiguous political boundaries of the county itself. So, Jefferson County is in a unique position in that it's uh, the, the Port Authority's board can use its suite of economic incentives that we have to work on projects anywhere in Jefferson County rather than just strictly at the water's edge, which is very helpful. In terms of my role as executive director, in addition to staffing the board, um, I run the day-to-day -day operations of the Port Authority and work with our stakeholders on existing projects, uh, as well as meet with interested parties looking at locating and or expanding in the county. Hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, the JCPA, what the JCPA is and what we do. So. All right, thank you, Jim. Okay, Dennis, we're gonna kick things off with you. What's new and exciting at your port in terms of first mile, last mile improvements being made? Yeah, thank you, Mary, we're, we appreciate that. So uh, we just finished construction of a new street. Uh, it's actually a rehabilitation of an old street, an old oil and ship road, uh, much of which was out here on the Army base property. Uh, when it was built in the 1940s, 
didn't worry about heavy trucks, didn't worry about a lot of overloaded or overweight things. Uh, we have totally converted the property now and bringing in these heavy haul trucks uh, to our warehouses for, for movement of products and goods and services to, to the uh, harbors as well. So uh, this construction on 4th Street that was completed uh, basically took the old, uh, we just offset the road completely, built a brand new full depth concrete road uh, that really now completes or, or is close to completing the circulation uh, corridor around our main industrial park. Uh, just a whole lot better opportunity to bring in trucks more quickly, more safely, more efficiently uh, on those roads and not have to worry about the potholes that we were having uh, showing up on these oil and chip roads. The same thing's happening. Uh, we're just getting ready to get started uh, on a new street, uh, really basically tearing out the old street, putting in a new one on First Street, which is the main uh, circulation uh, corridor in front of our warehouses that you see along Illinois Route 3. Uh, again, this was an oil and chip road, uh, probably one of the first uh, worst streets in, in condition wise in the local area. And this will uh, basically tear it all out, put in full depth concrete and really create an opportunity uh, for better traffic flow and truck flow. It also then incorporates a sixth entrance into the port off of Illinois Route 3. So this will be what's called a right in right out or a southbound entrance in and a southbound turn out. So there will not be a traffic signal there. Uh, but it'll just be for flow of trucks uh, coming and going from the ports, uh, warehouses, and industrial park. I think uh, another one we just finished recently was the upgrade of the Bissell Street rail crossing. Uh, this was a total uh, tear out of the entire crossing of that roadway uh, and put in uh, all new sub base ballast, uh, everything, and then put the rail track back in. And then the uh, electronics, upgraded the electronics for the lights and gates there that are on that street. So just uh, Again, those first mile, last mile improvements. And Mary, I, I think one I'll add because I think these, these really link so closely together is manufacturing uh, from a first mile, last mile improvement perspective. Uh, we are working now on rehabilitation of a 1940s era building. Uh, this was a 50,000 square foot building uh, that was formerly used as a locomotive repair shop for the US Army. Uh, we are now uh, getting ready to spend about $3 million on that building, upgrading it for manufacturing purposes. So we're actively looking now uh, for a company to come in and, and take advantage of this. It's a 40 foot clear height building, uh, again, built in the 1940s, tremendously uh, old solid building, uh, but needs upgrades now for you know, sprinklers, fire sprinkler system, office space, uh, just new upgrades and that sort of thing. So we're really, really looking forward to getting that uh, project kicked off. Excellent, Dennis. Great example of how you're repurposing some of the, the vacant buildings that we have in this area. Okay, Jim, tell us a little bit about the recent funding your Port Authority received from the state of Missouri and the innovative new service it will support. Thank you, Mary. Uh, before I delve into the state appropriations and what it will fund, it's important for me to circle back and remind folks um, how we got to this point and what sparked all the support and momentum that we've received which was the decision by our partners at American Patriot Holdings to focus on Herculaneum as the northernmost terminal for their groundbreaking liner vessels. These will be self-propelled container ships that have been designed specifically and designed and patented specifically to make the riverborne transport of containerized cargo possible on America's inland waterways. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that further with anybody who'd like to know more about it. Uh, we've talked about it at length several previous Freightway discussions. Uh, basically, uh, through a series of MOUs that were signed in 2020, 2021, in which American Patriot Holdings demonstrated and then strengthened their commitment to utilize the site in Herculaneum, Missouri, as the northernmost terminal for their container on vessel uh, service, we were then able to take that momentum and head to Jefferson City last year and secure an appropriation of $25 million in state taxpayer money that will fund a list of approximately 14 infrastructure related projects that need to be completed for the go run site to be prepared to receive APH's liners, uh, which we have been told and continue to be told are due to start arriving here uh, by the fourth quarter of 2025. And Mary has a development map that shows kind of a conceptual drawing of what the site will look like uh, some of the projects that will be done and, and actually 
uh, are uh, are well advanced, um, include the design and construction of ag new access roads, the relocation of existing utilities, and the permitting design and construction of a new bulk materials processing facility that will be located on the southeastern portion of the property, uh, which is currently River Bottoms right now. So exciting times. Uh, we've, uh, in terms of where we are in process, we have secured our funding agreement with MoDOT. We have that in place after a very lengthy period of discussion with them. Um, we have received several proposals and have engaged a firm WSP to uh, begin to put some of these into place. We have our master service agreement, which is under review right now, uh, which will allow us to move forward on several of these projects. Uh, and so things are slowly but surely untangling themselves with all of the, the bureaucracy and everything else. And, and we hope to hopefully be moving dirt here in the not too distant future. So that's kind of what's what's going on on the site. But I want to make sure I came back and circle back on the, on the container on liner, a container on vessel service for everybody who wasn't aware of that. So. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and you're right, it is an exciting time. And we're looking forward to having more announcements from American Patriot Holding uh, sometime this calendar year. Okay, Ed, we understand you've received a variety of recent grants and support of multiple projects across your various project locations. Tell us about the work underway. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have five terminals. So each one of those have infrastructure needs and upgrades. But at our KPD one location, which is outside of New Athens, Originally was an outbound coal facility. We repurposed that about 15 years ago to receive inbound scrubber stone to a power plant, the last uh, permitted coal fire power plant in the country. And as a result of that, they've been um, producing waste products that have now gained marketability. That includes gypsum and flash. So in order to move that to market, uh, we need to upgrade our terminal because they want to ship 2 million tons of product outbound. That's huge. So in order to maintain the inbound movement at the same time, we need to build a second rail loop at our terminal. But also to make it more efficient, we had to look at a phase two part of the project, which is to build a rail yard at the terminal and upgrade our rail corridor that we own from uh, the terminal to Lensburg, Illinois. Uh, those two projects together total $20 million. And we're currently in engineering right now for the loop track. Uh, we're in the um, grant agreement phase with Barad for phase two on the upgrade of the rail and the rail yard. Uh, next to that, which um, would be uh, our next terminal south, is KRPD number two. And we received a couple grants there uh, from IDOT, one for a new conveyor uh, to move fertilizer from the dock over to an expansion that's going to take place at Gateway FS. And they're going to increase their fertilizer um, input uh, throughput at that location. Um, we're also going to, um, at that location, received a freight grant to double track our rail underneath our overhead crane and to reduce congestion and improve safety at that location. Uh, it also sets us up very nicely uh, for future growth at that facility. So the current grants that we have approved total about $32 million. And um, then uh, we recently submitted uh, some grants for a south, a new South Dock at our KRPD2 location. That was a $14 million project submittal. And then we also um, submitted a um, Marine Highway, U.S. Marine Highway grant for a series of shuttle cars so we could move coil steel through our terminal and to our tenants since we're going to see an increase of coil steel at this location. And those improvements total about $16 million. So together, that's $47 million worth of projects, partly funded. The other ones are in the process. And then we have some additional work we want to do. We want to add a um, second entrance road to our terminal and add a laydown yard for one of our tenants. And that's a $3 million project that's in the works as far as um, moving forward with the grant application. Um, we have one lock and dam on the Cascask River. And um, outside of that, we're lock free, ice free, all the way to New Orleans. So we have great opportunities for many people at different locations. Thank you, Ed. Susan, there's a lot of investment occurring within your port facilities as well. What can you tell our audience about those? 
I'd say most recently, we focused our, our um, investments on our municipal river terminal uh, that's operated by SCF, uh, Lewis and Clark terminals. So in the last couple of years, and currently we've spent about $10 million, um, we've put in a rail river conveyor system, we've added rail into the yard. Um, we're currently paving the yard, it's not mostly unpaved, so we're putting down some concrete uh, surfaces. Um, SCF recently got a grant for unitized cargo equipment, and we're expanding rail there. The goal is to get a unit train uh, capability there and to thus attract new cargo. Um, as um, the other ports in the region know, uh, SCF got a, a terrific uh, build grant a year or two ago and 9 million of that build grant is gonna be spent at our municipal river terminal to expand the rail there. Um, so that's gonna really drive a lot of rail traffic to that facility. Um, we have uh, upcoming investments or ones that are kind of underway. We're trying to develop a new rail and river terminal on our South Riverfront. We've gotten a 5.76 million ARPA grant towards that. Uh, we're talking to a new lessee about a potential liquid fertilizer dock on our North Riverfront. And we have some unfleeted uh, areas. So we're trying to develop fleeting on our riverfronts. We're gonna be issuing some RFPs soon for fleeting, uh, which is very valuable here. Um, and um, as some of you know, there's a, a developer interested in a, a large development just south of MacArthur Bridge. It's a $1.2 billion project, and it will focus on manufacturing. Dennis, tell us about any recent grant funding that is fostering other improvements at your port. I feel like there's so much money being spent now with these ports, as you're hearing with Ed and 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 uh, Jim and Susan. So uh, yes, we've also had some here as well. Uh, the the bet the best one is the one that Susan just talked about, which is the build grant uh, that SCF was uh, fortunate enough to apply for and get. So that's 28 million dollars that will go to five river terminal facilities on both sides of the river. Some at Susan's uh, place there at MRT and and Tyler Street. Uh, some here at America Central Port District as well, and then in East St. Louis. So that's $28 million of efficiencies, improvements, upgrades, uh, rail track, a lot of that going to rail track and, and those types of upgrades. But it's it's about moving that product more efficiently. So just a tremendous pro project there. We can't thank SCF enough for getting that, uh, that, getting that grant. Uh, also, uh, Illinois Department of Transportation and State of Illinois have been great partners. Uh, I think you heard some there from Ed as well. But uh, Illinois has just been uh, tremendous here. They had a uh, capital uh, program here a few years ago. We're now implementing some of those projects that we've got going. Uh, one of those is a truck calling and staging center that we're putting in place, trying to keep the trucks backed up. You know, they, they, right now at certain times of the year, we, they back up out onto Route 3. Uh, so this will be trying to create some order and semblance as those trucks are coming in, either for picking product up or dropping it off and uh, trying to get them to one location, stage them there, and then dispatch them to where we need to across the property. So that's a great project that's coming up. Uh, First Street that I mentioned earlier uh, was partially funded by Illinois Department of Transportation. So uh, that, that right in, right out, that was from a previous round of competitive grant funding that uh, through a freight program that the state of Illinois had. And then just recently, we were uh, announced for a couple of more projects. One is the expansion of our uh, Granite City car, uh, cargo dock uh, at the Granite City Harbor through some state of Illinois funding. And then also IDOT is also going to uh, put some money toward West 7th Street, which will complete that uh, loop of our main industrial park uh, there within the heart of the industrial park of, of, the, of the port. Um, and then uh, I, I just think, you know, all these great projects, all this funding that's been coming for all of our port facilities has just been tremendous and just can't thank enough uh, those who have been uh, now realizing the importance of ports throughout the country. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and I agree. Um, the theme is focusing on infrastructure investment at the ports and carriers and users are driving that market and driving that growth. Um, so we're excited about all of these examples um, for infrastructure investment. So Jim, we understand you are also working to leverage the $25 million you received from the state for other developments within the Jefferson County Port Authority. What can you tell our audience about those plans? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question, Mary. Yeah, this is an exciting opportunity uh, that was made possible by the creation last year 
of a series of new grant programs fueled by federal ARPA dollars uh, that the Missouri Department of Economic Development designed to help some of the uh, most impacted industries recover from COVID-related shutdowns and revenue losses. One of the programs was specifically designed uh, to both identify previously utilized industrial sites that have fallen out of productive use and to provide a pool of seed funding for uh, local entities like the JCPA uh, to utilize to bring them back online for redevelopment as soon as possible. As everybody knows, industrial ground these days is very, very hard to find. Um, as part of the, the development of this grant program, the state of Missouri set up two separate pots of money within this program. One for projects of 100 contiguous acres or less, and one for projects of 1,000 contiguous acres or more. And after lengthy discussions with our stakeholders, in addition to regional development, economic development organizations, uh, the JCPA decided to apply for the mega site designation, which is 1,000 contiguous acres or more, um, putting our $25 million that we received in state appropriations up in a dollar for dollar match with this program, or which has a maximum award for the mega sites of $25 million, setting us up potentially, um, if all goes well, to have $50 million in state funding uh, that we can use on all of these, uh, what we're calling the Jefferson, to identify and develop what we're calling the Jefferson County Regional Intermodal Port System and Mega Site. Um, basically, and, and Mary has a map of this that they're going to be putting up, uh, we've identified approximately 2,200 acres, uh, six miles of Mississippi River frontage that are either currently in productive use as manufacturing and or logistics facilities such as U.S. Silica in Festus, uh, sites that are in the process of redevelopment such as the James Hardy uh, fiber cement siding plant in Crystal City, as well as our container on vessel site in Herculaneum, as well as sites that are currently vacant, uh, but which can either in the short term or the long term, uh, potentially be brought back into productive use as manufacturing and or logistics facilities. The critical portion of, of all of these sites is they all contain multiple modes of ingress and egress into them and out of them. Now you combine this opportunity with uh, the currently approved and budgeted uh, expansion of I-55 from three lanes from Highway Z and Peevely down to the newly to a newly redesigned Highway 6167 interchange south of Festus, and the momentum generated by these projects really dovetails uh, with our overall effort, which is to identify and promote the existing ecosystem within Jefferson County not just for the work currently underway, but for interested parties looking for a pathway and a plan for moving forward into the future in the county. So that's really an exciting opportunity that came to us. Um, our stakeholders really drove the process on that, and uh, we're very excited about the potential of a project like that. So that's what's going on. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Ed, looking to the future, you have a feasibility study underway related to Scott Air Force Base and an ongoing study with the Army Corps of Engineers. Tell us about those initiatives. Well, I guess, what does a port district have to do with Air Force Base? And uh, it is located in our port district. It is uh, uh, an economic generator for the region of Southwest Illinois, employees between the military and the civilians, about 25,000 people, the largest employer, employer in Southwest Illinois. During the backgrounds, uh, deficiencies were noted at various bases around the country. And two uh, important deficiencies that Cloud Air Force Base were identified. One was the need for a longer runway. The county built that runway and it took that base off of its critical list of being considered for closure. But another lingering problem was the delivery of fuel to that, that air base. It currently is being shipped in by truck. And that truck, um, has to go past critical facilities at the base, including a school. So under current uh, concerns with terrorism and security, it's not the best way to bring fuel into a, uh, an air base. So if we want to keep that air base thriving and off any future lists, 
we need to look at an alternative fuel source for that base. And the feasibility study that we have approved is to look at our northernmost terminal on the Kaskaska River, which is at River Mile 36, the uppermost limit. It's only 16 miles from the Scott Air Force Base. So if we could construct a pipeline to our terminal, we could barge in fuel to that location and be kind of a fuel um, depot and pipe it up to Scott Air Force Base and remove some of the security issues and also provide resiliency, redundancy, and surety of fuel delivery. And also it serves as a backup location should there need to be a truck delivery at some point. Um, and I think it has lots of merit. Uh, we have tremendous support from Scott Air Force Base military leadership of wanting to see this project move forward. So we're just at the very beginning stages of that project, but I think it has tremendous uh, opportunities down the road. And second, as a study with the Corps of Engineers, uh, Ports work closely with the Corps uh, in many different ways. And several years ago, we identified a need at our KRPD number two harbor to look at future long-term maintenance and also growing that location. So we were approved for a section 107 cap study. And uh, we were in the midst of that study when we were approached by another tenant, uh, potential tenant to look at uh, North Harbor at that same location. So we were able to get the core to pause the study until uh, the appropriate time. And so we've restarted that study now to complete it, look at both harbors, the North and the South as a potential at that location. And uh, we hope to have that report, the preliminary report done by next year. And if I think it should look positive because the five alternatives they identified in the first half of the report were all positive benefit to cost ratio. So um, we should see construction start, I think in two years um, at the Harbor, particularly the South Harbor. We don't know yet about the North Harbor, but um, these really help us work and grow, all these things come together from the grants we got approved for land side up uh, outside of the harbor improvements to these improvements in the river. So these are great things happening for the port. Okay, thank you, Ed. Susan, beyond grants secured, we understand your port authority also has other avenues available to invest. Tell us about those. Because we're a political subdivision of the state, we can offer uh, some uh, major uh, investment incentives. We can issue Chapter 68 bonds, for example. So in 2018, we issued 15 million in bonds to an agricultural entity called Itograni on our South Riverfront to help them help propel their $37 million expansion. Um, in 2019, we issued 8.75 million in bonds to a a scrap company to uh, buy and relocate a shredder to our North Riverfront, which has enabled them to consolidate their operations and expand. And we're currently talking to that developer of the $1.2 billion project about uh, Chapter 68 bonds to help them with their manufacturing container on vessel project just south of MacArthur Bridge. Um, in addition, we can create port improvement districts so most recently last year we created, we are in the process of creating one for the soccer stadium, the new soccer stadium that uh, was built just uh, kind of caddy corner from Union Station. And they encountered some unexpected groundwater pollution. And so our Port Improvement District will help them generate funds to, to address that, that issue. Thank you, Susan. Jim, you got 60 seconds. What haven't we talked about that you wanna be sure our audience knows about today? Sure. Just um, in terms of Jefferson County, um, we, for a long time, it's it been through several uh, different administrations, uh, have not been as coordinated as we should be on economic development. And uh, we are now working with our Economic Development Corporation down here to coordinate better and to upgrade a lot of our offerings and our services. So, uh, for anybody interested, not not necessarily if, if it's not port related, if it's just economic development related, if you're looking at locating or relocating or expanding a facility, please reach out and let us know. We're we're happy to put you in contact. We've had multiple uh, site selectors contact us. We just had a site selector down here last week, so we're happy to to work with you. The leadership down here in the county is is happy to entertain any and all 
folks looking to uh, locate facilities or expand or, or whatever they need to do. So Jefferson County is officially open for business. That's what I want people to know. Okay, very good. Ed, your turn to cover anything important about Kaskaskia Regional Port District that we didn't touch on yet. Well, I think we're uniquely positioned and located in the St. Louis region. Um, we're close to the hustle and bustle and um, uh, not in the St. Louis Harbor, but we offer an opportunity to um, grow uh, businesses in our area. We're congestion-free alternative to, and a safe way to get to market um, with only one lock and dam on the Kaskaska River. We also look at, we have land opportunities available for people. And with our infrastructure upgrades, we're going to have uh, great capacity within our terminals to move cargo to any tenant that wants to locate there. All right, very good. Okay, Susan, this is your 60 second elevator speech. Any closing comments for our audience? Yes, I think it's important for people to realize that we are by far the busiest inland port. Um, so if you use a density metric like uh, Europe uses, we have more, we have like 130 facilities in our harbor, both sides of the river. Uh, we did a graphic a few years ago that's illegible because there are so many harbors or so many facilities in the harbor. But uh, we're, so we have about 130 facilities here. Uh, we're the northernmost lock and ice free port. And we have 1,200 to 1,400 fleeting berths. Uh, we're also the Ag Coast of America. So, you know, if you want to do business that involves shipping, uh, come to St. Louis. We just have um, so many different options and we have ultimate flexibility and last mile uh, in and out options for people. Thank you, Susan. Okay, Dennis, the bar has been set really high. You got 60 seconds. Your final thoughts for our audience. And thank you, Mary. I appreciate that. So I, I will tell you uh, just one of the things we kind of talked about today, but we really didn't call it by name was global supply chain. And that piece, uh, it, it is so important, so imperative for, for the inland ports. They play a big part of that role in moving products and goods across the country. And people don't realize that. Uh, the federal government now is getting it and understanding it. And that's why so much money now is being sent to some of these inland ports, like you heard about today, to try to take care of this backlog of, of issues uh, to, to increase that efficiency and keep those products moving across the country. So it's, it's been fantastic from that standpoint. You know, people don't realize from a transloading perspective uh, and from a barge and transportation perspective that one, barge equals this the same amount of commodity as about 22 rail cars or 90 trucks so when you think about the amount of product we're able to move through these small inland ports and then you take one barge and then you multiply that times 15 or 20 or 30 barges that you see in a barge tow going up and down the river it's pretty incredible the amount of product that we're able to move very cost effectively up and down the river system and i'll mention one other thing today uh, that I heard about, which I, I think people definitely don't realize about inland ports, and that is economic development. Uh, and, and just things, crazy things sometimes that we get involved in, but so important to the economy. You heard about Scott Air Force Base through Kaskaskia Regional Port District with Ed, and Susan mentions their, their uh, reliance on or their, their participation in the St. Louis City Soccer Stadium. A lot of that happens from an economic development standpoint where these ports get involved in things and, and spend some money in order to create jobs and keep that uh, economy moving forward. Just really appreciate the opportunity today, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, everyone. Today's discussion has been great. You all have unique roles within the regional port system, but there's a common thread that connects you. You are continuing to invest in your facilities with an eye to the future, making sure that all the ports in this region have the capacity and infrastructure to accommodate future growth. It's our pleasure to be able to highlight those investments, which collectively strengthen our region's role as a global freight hub. Thank you for sharing it with us. I'd also like to give a final thank you to our sponsors for Freight Week STL 2023. Their support makes it possible for us to continue to deliver the great content that is the hallmark of this annual conference. Freight Week continues tomorrow with our in-person freight summit, the first one since 2019. We will be featuring the release of the 2024 Priority Project List, a valuable tool used to advocate for support and funding for critical infrastructure improvements, including several planned at our region's port facilities. The event will also feature a keynote address that will spotlight the East Coast's largest container import gateway, the Port of New York and New Jersey. 
while highlighting its rail connectivity to the St. Louis region. We're looking forward to gathering in person and hope some of you will be able to join us. For those who can't, we'll be recording the event so we can make it available afterwards. We also encourage you to share links to any of our Freight Week content with others who may be interested.